How long was it after um, everything happened that the, the the book fell out of or the essay fell out of your fingers? About a year. About a year. I wrote the essay about a year after I got back from Mongolia. And were you ready? I mean, to write it. Define ready. Do you, did you feel like I'm up for this? I'm up for putting well, my experience in words. I think I was putting it in words even while it was happening. I mean, I think that's not it. That's what I mean about it not being a decision. I think that for me, it's always been like sentences come into my head. And then, so that's not a decision. It's just what's happening. And then about a year after I got back from Mongolia, I was like, I'm going to organize my sentences <laughs> into one thing. And yeah, I do. Yeah, I was ready. I, yeah, yes, I wanted to do it and I did. Mm -hmm. And do you have that in every situation or only when something big no. happens that the sentences come? When I'm working on something, like when I'm doing an article for The New Yorker, I, God damn it. <laughs> I know, I'm so annoying. Just make it, give me, give me one minute to make it stop happening. <laughs> I don't Okay, I, I can't. <laughs> so just, just live with me. Okay. Um, I have to. Um, so what is the point? So yeah, when I'm writing a story for The New Yorker, yeah, whenever I'm working on a story, there's sentences coming into my head because there better be. <laughs> and then with this, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a choice. It just happened by accident. And can you tell me what happened since, since the end of the book, really? How has your life developed? Well, the thing is that, so the book covers a period in my life that ended about five years ago. And so, and the book is largely, I mean, it's about a bunch of things, but one of the big things it's about is like, is grief. And it's a period in my life when I lost my house and my spouse and my son all in a short period of time. So it just kind of felt like, like there was like a sucking pull, like yanking my life out. And that's very much like a grief experience. And so... It's been a while since I've been in that. So it's interesting to me because people will say like that the book sounds um, very self-recriminating, that I'm hard on myself in it, which to me, and I, from, from what I know from a lot of women, it's very much part of the experience of miscarriage. Is I have yet to meet a woman who lost a baby who told me, yeah, I never felt guilty at all. I felt, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of it as far as I can tell. So there's, it's very much in that experience. Years have gone by since then. So I'm not in a, I, so the main thing that's happened since then is I'm not grieving in that way. And I'm not in a state of, you know, self-recrimination. Mm. Did you move past the guilt? Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sad. I wish my kid had lived. I wish I had a five-year-old, mm -hmm. which is what he would be. That's sad. But I don't feel guilty about it anymore because I believe in science. How but it's hard. Even if you do believe in science, it's hard. I've yet to speak to a woman who lost a baby who didn't feel guilty. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's just part of that package. How often do you think of your kids? Well, lately a lot because I promote this book, so I talk about it constantly. Yes. <laughs> um, but other than that, probably only around Thanksgiving, which is this American holiday in November, which is when I was in Mongolia, which is when I lost this baby. So that's when, really. Hmm. Like. And to get where you are now, did writing help? Well, the problem is, I don't know, because I have nothing to compare it to. Like, I've never had that series of experiences and not written a book. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. we'd have to, in order to know, I'd have to have the same ser series of experiences, not write a book, and then we'd compare. Yes. But I am not willing <laughs> to, do to do that experiment, so we no. won't know. No, I think it's a good idea not to repeat it so I've, I'm gonna ask Nina Pollock to join us and I have invited Nina to because are you um, gonna liberate me <laughs> yes okay, okay. I, told you I, <laughs> um, I invited Nina because I think there's a lot of similarities between both your work are you taking a picture of this part <laughs> Absolutely. this for posterity 
<laughs> and Nina wrote, she writes about popular culture for the correspondent, and she wrote a book called We Zullen Niet de Pletter Slaan. It's, it's right over here next to your book. Um, and I tried to translate that, and I, I went with We Will Not Beat to Death, but someone should do that better than me, because I also think it really should be translated. And the book is about family with two mothers and two children, um, and they're all trying really hard to do their best, um, and they mean really well, but they're in a way inept in living. Um, and they know what they want to be, they want to be a father, a mother, a hero, a lover, um, but they don't know how to get there. So Nina, please join us. <laughs> How would, how would you translate it? Well, I mean, the title was taken from a translation from a Wordsworth poem, which is weird, but the line was just so good. The English line, I believe, is, do not dread the waves below, mm. which is a bit different than beating to death. Uh, yes, oh absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It is. Nina, you read uh, Ariel Levy's book, and I was wondering, what did you think? It'd be funny if you were like, I just hate it. <laughs> yeah, it would. <laughs> I know she didn't. I wish I could do that. That would be nice. But, but it's, uh, it, I thought it was great, actually, the book. It, this will be uh, uh, embarrassing for you, but uh, it's a great book. Not as embarrassing uh, as if you hated it. Right. That'd be okay. more embarrassing. Um, I think it was, it's incredibly honest. And it, this is a thing uh, that's been said about a lot of books lately, especially memoirs. Um, but it's actually quite rare, actual honesty, and I think this book is actually honest. It's, uh, it, it's got a lot of integrity. Um, and I feel when, like, uh, in my heart when I uh, judge a book, it's mostly uh, by the voice, by its voice, and whether I find that it rings true. Uh, and your voice is true to me, so that's. It's, it's that sounds qu kind of esoteric, but it's. Uh, I don't think. I mean, it's I very think important. To me, so. the point in doing it was that you know I've been writing journalism for 20 years, and what you do as a reporter is try to piece together the truth from what you from what other people tell you. That's reporting. It's going and asking people for their version of events and their version of you know what they experience, and then you put them all together and try to think what the truth is and write that as vividly as you can. And the point with this book, the part I thought would be interesting to me was what would it be like to try to tell a story where you were there for all of it, where you know the whole truth in so far as any of us can mm. know the truth about anything. I mean, you could know your own version of the truth and try to write that as precisely as possible. And I found that really thrilling, like really something really exciting about that experiment about just saying, okay, what, how, can, am, can I write the truth? Yeah, and I think you read that in the book, and, and I also think you read that you're a reporter. I mean, it's mm -hmm. got some sort of factuality to it. It's un completely unsentimental about a, a hugely s tragic events, which, and I think that works. I mean, you're, you're funny and factual and, um, I mean, still, the book blows you away emotionally as well, and that's... Uh... Thanks. I mean, first of all, I think that that style of, like, a declarative style as It is a style, to... right? It's yeah. something you choose very... Absolutely. Yeah. Well, for me, at this point, it's not really a choice because I've been doing it for 20 years. But, but the reason I think I write like that is because I'm used to writing journalism, mm. and it's frowned upon to be too goopy in journalism, right? It's like what you want to achieve is What's actually- goopy? What's goopy? Oh, sorry, it's not even a proper thing to say. It's like sloppy talk. It's uh, just um, overly emotional, sentimental, right? right? Yeah. So in journalism, your task is supposed to be, it's quite manipulative, really. I mean, your task is to make the reader feel and think what you, what you are hoping to make that person feel and think without them being aware right. of the steering yeah. mechanism. Is that something you try also when you work to make them feel and think? Well, I mean, I hate it when I feel manipulated when I read a book. 
and you that's something I really try not subtly. to do. <laughs> yeah, you have to do it very subtly, but I mean, uh, still, if you, it's hard not to have it show. You see that in other books all the time, and you managed beautifully. Thank you. Did you recognize other things as well? Um, I mean, of course, I recognized the part about having to learn that you don't get everything you want. But I mean, the, the thing that I recognize most, maybe that has to do, that relates to my book is, is, is the ambivalence part about the ambivalence between uh, domesticity uh, and adventure, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the desire to, to build a home and to be at home and to be attached, to be free on the other hand. Uh, that's what I write about still. Yeah. And I think that that ambivalence, I think that's like a, fu that's a fundamental aspect of human life. I think right. that, you know, once you get through sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you've got your basic survival stuff sorted, this, the tension between wanting family, intimacy, domesticity, security, on the one hand, and novelty, adventure, passion, on the other, is like a fundamental human conflict. But we're used to hearing about it from men because up until very recently, women didn't really get to leave the house, so you didn't get to, to work out that conflict in literature, you know? So I think that's why I think sometimes it's like spoken about in terms of like, like that it's a, a women's, a, a woman's issue, this conflict between domesticity and the, the desire for domesticity and the desire for adventure. And I don't think that's true. I think it's all human beings. We're just not used to hearing it from women. Right, but I mean, in literature, women before us, generations before us, they were, they were concerned with just the being free. There was no choice. And you either had to be a lesbian and unmarried or a nun to be able to be free and right. Or well, and even uh, then, you had to find a way to feed yourself. Right. Mm. So, uh, um, but I mean, yeah. So we're lucky in a way, that's what yeah. you're saying, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very, yeah. as, as, as certain critics have pointed out, and all I can say is, yeah, I know, it's a privileged perspective to have, it's a, it's a, it's a high class problem. Right, I mean, but the book is very clear about you knowing this. Uh, well, I think yeah, so. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> But not everyone. But maybe. not everyone does. But what can you do? I'm going to read you something that, that you wrote. Um, you say writing is communicating with an unknown intimate who is always available. But then when your book, it leaves you. Somebody's having a, what do you call the Friday thing? <laughs> the fry me bow. Someone's having a fry me bow over there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. What? Absolutely. But then it's, it's intimate between you and the, and the paper and you write, but then it leaves you and I was wondering how much do you share? How do you decide what you're going to share? Do you, sh do you, sh yeah? How do you decide on that? It's a very different question for a memoir writer than a fiction writer, mm -hmm. of course. I know, you're right? so lucky. Yeah, I know. Oh well, <laughs> I, it went totally wrong for me. I know my, I decided on not sharing anything about my personal life when I first published this book. Okay. I thought I'm not going to talk about my sexuality. I'm not going to talk about anything. And then I went to have my first radio interview. And this guy, the first thing he asked me is, do you want to be a mother? And I was like, oh no, I'm, I, I, I can't answer. I don't want to talk about myself. That's, that's silly. And then I answered, I said, yes. And then the whole rest of the interview, I, ju I thought, oh my God, I just told this guy, I want to be a mother. Do I want to be a mother? And I'm on air, it's live. Oh, and then, I mean, I, I mean, you realize later on, you can't write a book about intimate stuff of people and not talk about yourself at all. Even as a fiction writer, it's, it's very hard to do, especially in these times when people want to know who authors are. They want to talk about you, right? So well, in my case, I can never be like, how dare you? Because people are like, well, you said so. <laughs> right. So anytime I'm like, that's a very personal question, people are like, it's not my fault. You wrote a book <laughs> right. about yeah. everything private. So I have no... I'm saying it's different. Yeah, I have no... You could be like, I, I like to just stick to the work. I, I'm not really... I, any, that's very hard to do. 
Even for fiction writers, I bet. And yeah. I can't do it. I can't keep a secret. <laughs> but, I mean, I think your question was, what do you, is there oh, a lie? You leave yeah. It's okay. <laughs> it's it's I, fine. I, li I, like, I like it. And you go on. I think that's a really good out? question. And I think, though, the answer for me, honestly, is I don't really know how it works. I, I just know that I always wanted to be a writer. And it's what I've been doing with my time for 20 years. So at this point, there, it just, in my head, feels like here's the way this wants to be. Here's how this structure wants to be. And here's, I, I just get a feeling for it. I don't know how it happens. I just know it only happens if I sit down and like force myself to do it every day. And then it's, then it's a job, you know, then it's like a job I had learned how to do. And that was part of why I wanted to write the book is I just sort of felt like if I had heard the story I'm telling in that book about someone else, I would probably want to tell it because it's sort of a dramatic story and it involves a lot of the issues that I've been interested in writing about for decades, like what does it mean to be a woman? And the, what we were talking about a minute ago, the conflict between the desire mm -hmm. for autonomy and adventure versus the desire for intimacy and uh, what's the other thing? Domesticity. Mm -hmm. And just a lot of the things in there I would want to write about. So I, I went for it basically. Is this the beginning of you being, being a memoirist? Or yes. Is it, this is, so you're, 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 this you're is becoming it. John Didion. This may That's, be the end, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going to write more? We'll of, see. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I mean, so, I'll write more. I don't know if I'll write you. more about me. Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> There's, we'll there's been a, in a few articles they mentioned that feminism is the, the main reason why you also thought, like, I can have it all. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, yes, yes and no. Yes and no, okay. <laughs> I'm very big on saying that the idea that you can have everything you want in life is not thinking of a feminist, it's mm -hmm. thinking of a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. No feminist ever said, there's no feminist piece of writing that says, you can have every single thing you want. That is not no. feminism. Feminism says you're fully human, you're a full human being, and the human condition is everybody doesn't get everything. So, on the one hand, I don't think this is about fem that th that this that my illusion of control. I wouldn't attribute that to feminism. I don't think it's feminism's fault. On the other hand, I think feminism was necessary to get to a point where we could leave the bloody house and have careers and have choices. So you wouldn't have some of these dilemmas if you didn't have choices, and you wouldn't have choices if you didn't have feminism. But I was also thinking, does, did the 90s, mm. in a period when everything was possible, did that not make a lot of people think like toddlers? Maybe, I mean, to some extent, sure. I mean, I think, what I think makes us think like toddlers is mostly this. I do, <laughs> I think this is making us so stupid. I really do, and I think that's a, a sad thing. But, and, and that gives us the illusion, you just, eh, eh, and you don't have to know anything. You don't have to have, you just check, check, you know, everything's immediate. I think that, that messes with us. On the other hand, in the 90s, when it's true, like there was a lot, it was a, a simpler time in a lot of ways. I mean, like we didn't realize how real global warming was. Like it still seemed like maybe this will blow over, you know, and maybe email will blow over. I mean, a lot of these things yeah. seem like, eh. <laughs> However, there were still women and the, there were still women losing babies. You know, there were still women who couldn't conceive, among with lots of other worse problems. But I'm just saying, to some extent, this book is about my experience. And plenty of people had problems as bad or worse than mine in the 90s, you know? Mm -hmm. I understand. I was wondering about that, not being able to have it all. In a way, do you also feel um, obligatory to have it all, so that you want it all, but do you also feel that society tells you you should have it all? That's not just a thing you want, but also external that, they sh that you should, that you should be, have a career, be a mother, have a family, have an exciting life. Well, I certainly think that like, there is some upside in learning, in, in not learning, in um, acknowledging your own limitations. Like, the part of all the things I write about that I'm grateful for is being sort of liberated from the illusion of control because it, there's a certain 
there was something a little relaxing about being like, I think I'm gonna surrender a little because I cannot, it's been proven to me that I can't control my life the way I thought I could. Um, so there's a difference between, between, <laughs> uh, between control and sort of greed of wanting to have it all. I think maybe capitalism wants us to have it all. That's the cliche. And I think it does, right? I mean, and, and, and I think uh, uh, there's pressure that some people feel to have it all. But you have, you can, you have control over that. You have control over how much the pressure gets to you. As but it's a what's it all? Yeah, what's like we're it saying all? it as if it's like a thing. What is? It? I mean, it depends what you want. Like for me, a, the biggest thing was I wanted to be a writer. Like that was the thing I prioritized from the beginning, above all else. And like, not everyone wants that. You know, so it depends. Yeah, of course. I mean, but I mean, in this case, it's, it's the house, the baby, the career, the the friends, the health, right? Everything you can you can want. I I, I don't feel. I don't feel I can have it all, no. Well, it's good you know that. No, yeah. well, <laughs> I agree. I, I just, uh, I'm not a toddler anymore, since recently. <laughs> since when, when did you grow up? She's only like, th aren't you like 30? I'm 30, one. <laughs> when did I grow up? Yeah. I think maybe two years ago. That's great. Yeah, I don't know why it happened. <laughs> I just, I, yeah. I'm not there yet, I mean, but, uh, I think 30 is a lot better than 25. 25 is a lot remember. better than 20. <laughs> in a, you, I'm sorry. So in both your books, there's a relationship between two women. Um, you were married. Um, uh, and in your book, the, the mother of the family, one of the mothers of the family asked the other one to marry her. Mm -hmm. um, and Ariel, you describe the heteronormative standards as a made-up word from the land of academic <laughs> absurdity. That's another thing I like about the book. It's distinctly anti-academic, uh, which is... It uh, is a little uh, I like that, yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> and I was wondering... That's the word, it's heteronormativity. Or heteronormativity, yeah, yeah we, we, we talked about You that. hate this word. I don't like that word. Oh. Why not? Because it's not a real word. <laughs> it's a fake word. <laughs> But is it, is it, did you want it because it was the standard or both of you or, or, or do just human want these things? Do they just want someone who? I don't, look, I don't know. I can't speak for humankind. Like I just, I, I think that my former spouse and I wanted to get married partly because it's what people did and, and those reasons. And like, you know, what sort of you were saying a minute ago, like in life you wanted to, hit your marks. But I think we also wanted to get married because we loved each other so much and we were so close and we were like, this is it. Let's celebrate, you know, for, for lots of really beautiful reasons too. I mean, hmm. for both. I don't, I don't know. I, I think everyone gets married for all sorts of reasons, hmm. you know? Yeah. I don't know. How about the mothers in your book? Well, I think in my book, one mother asks the other, and she says, no, she doesn't want to get married to a woman. And I think that's the more, um, the, the stranger thing to do in, in our circles. I mean, uh, so why doesn't she want to get married? Why? Because it's so, in Holland it's so normal. Uh -huh. um, this is the, I, I am completely ambivalent about this and I, I find heteronormativity also an unuseful term in this context because yes, there is something, we, I grew up with a mom and a dad and a, and a nice family and they were married and it's just something that's inside of me also. And then again, there's also, it has nothing to do with heteronormative or politics. Like maybe let's try something else, maybe not get married. There's many reasons to get married and also many reasons not to get married. Mm -hmm. I like the, the, the idea of trying something else, just because, you know? And in your, in your book, you also bring the, up the question of the non-biological uh, mother and her mm -hmm. relationship with her children is difficult. And Ariel, your spouse sometimes felt left out. And I was wondering about, is that inevitable when you have two women in a relationship who want children? Is that always gonna be? I don't know, I mean, we never got to have the child, so she felt left out of a part of it that's very biological. Like pregnancy is only, I mean, that's all it is, is 
biological. I mean, and psychological, but you know what I'm saying. It's like, there's, it's not, if you're knocked up, you're knocked up. So, so I was, and she wasn't, and that, but I mean, how it would have been once the child was alive on know. earth, sadly, I'll never know. No. Um, but I will say that many of my friends who either have adopted children or who are gay and like the one who isn't the biological parent, more than one have said to me, oh, I think it's so much easier. Like really? I have a, yeah, I have a oh. friends who are lesbians who they have two kids. Each one of them biologically had one of the kids and they both were saying to me, it's so much easier to parent the one I didn't make which makes sense to me actually oh, that's it makes a lot of sense to me and it makes sense to me given the conversations I've had with my friends who have adopted children because you know it's I think it's just like one other little thing to help you not project all your self onto this person because the person doesn't look like you I don't know again I just I, it hasn't happened to me no. but that's what I've heard from my people I'm close to. Yeah, it's, it's you're strange. surprised. Hmm? No, yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I, I think it's nice, actually. I wrote this book partly because I wanted to, I wanted to see what this role is, it, because it's basically, basically a new role, like the non-biological mother. What, what are you when motherhood is something we associate so easily with all the physical stuff, you know? So what are you when you're a mother and not physical? Is it, are you like a dad? Are you, what, what is it that you are and how, what kind of role is that? I do um, want to point out that it's not entirely a new role. It's new when it's, you know, using medical science to make a choice to have a queer family. But what's not new is women dying in childbirth and their sisters or their friends course, taking of over. Course, or adopting, no. Yeah, kind of like raising kids who didn't come out of your body has been happening forever. Sure. That's true. Um, one of the things that I found most brave about both your books is you both are willing to take up space um and i by and what i mean by that is that you i felt when i read your books your there's an urgency in it um and i felt that you don't really care about what other people want you to write about but you wrote about what you thought you should write about and i was wondering as a woman doing that do you think there's a backlash for taking up space still Of course, yeah. I mean, you've seen it I, I, when I, you, you read the critiques of your books, and and it's partly this. It's partly. I don't know. I, I think mean, I've gotten off pretty easy. Yeah, you have. Like, but, I mean, but, people. I, mean, I I can't read Dutch, so it's possible. <laughs> it's in, no. It's seriously. It's possible that you know things I don't, and that Dutch people are like. No, no, no. But I'm, I'm in talking America, about the American critiques also. No, I mean, in America, I'm, I'm like, a, like this white woman, she is talking for herself. Like one uh, reviewer, one or, person who was white said that. <laughs> By and large, I got a really, I got a really positive reception with the book, and and I'm only saying that because it would just be just disingenuous of me to be like, oh, it was hard. It wasn't hard. It was easy in America. It may be different now that I'm doing it abroad, but in America it was easy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only thing, and it, what, you know what, I, it's not really true that it was hard, it's just reality. The essay Thanksgiving in Mongolia when I talk about losing this baby when I was on assignment, sure, I got emails from people being like, you're a murderer, you know, <laughs> but it's so stupid that <laughs> you know, it didn't feel great, but I also was like, I'm not, like, that's not true. That's not how science works. Like, so it didn't feel great, but it also felt like the people writing those emails were mean and not real smart. And maybe a bit jealous. I don't know if they were jealous. I mean, that, I mean, I wasn't writing about, I mean, I don't think they were jealous. No. It wasn't enviable. No. The situation. I was no, in. but maybe a few, and and the fact that you're I a writer people, and a strong I, woman. Maybe I think in America people go bonkers around um, birth and fetuses, and I think people there's a whole cult around motherhood that says you know basically anything that goes wrong from the from inside until the day 
people are very into blaming mothers in the United States. I don't know what it's like here. I mean, people go around putting little little models of embryos through the mailboxes. It's, just, it, it's not. I, I, know, I don't think it happens on the same scale as in the U.S., but it happens here too, and it's. And it's you said, Nina, that being brave enough to be inauthentic, that's freedom. <sighs> it's that's an interview three years ago. Mm -hmm. I might have been drunk when I said that. Really? Right? <laughs> I mean, I, I know what I mean by it, but it's... Tell us. what do you mean uh, yeah. It's in the context of this discussion around authenticity, you know? The, my generation was framed a lot uh, back then for wanting to be authentic, for having authenticity as like their their highest goal. And I thought, well, it's nice to be inauthentic like sometimes. Like the freedom to experiment? Yeah, yeah. yeah to, be, to, to not have to be pure and your, 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 your most inner, most individual self all the time. You can be something else, someone else. I don't know, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. That's what I meant. Hmm. It's not that interesting. Okay. <laughs> Oh, well, I do think it's quite interesting. I mean, it's not in a, that in boring. A, no, absolutely <laughs> not. And in a time where everything, even your cookies, have to be authentic. Right. Cookies? There's, well, if you, if well, there are cookies later on. <laughs> absolutely, but authentic no, but cookies. Authentic cookies, like you know, real home baked. Oh, I got it. No, so everything has to be real. I got it. I think it's interesting if someone says you don't, you don't have to have that. I got it now. Okay. <laughs> All I can think about are cookies. Cookies now. <laughs> sorry no, about sorry, that. <laughs> um, I want to go to something that... Um, well, you're the only person who I know besides me and the people who were there who also once joined an Al Anon meeting, mm. which is interesting because I, I don't think it's that big in the, in the Netherlands. You have to okay. tell people what that is. It. It's, it's a it support good. group. It's, it's it for spouses of addicts. Or, or not just spouses, for family. People who love addicts. So parents and children. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that funny? You guys have a weird Dutch sense of humor. <laughs> anyway, that's what it is. And you wrote about that also, that, that you noticed after going there that, that you were wondering how you failed to perceive that Lucy had never stopped drinking. And I wondered about that. Is it because you see it, but you don't register it? Can well, you tell me about Somebody in one of these meetings that you all are so tickled by <laughs> said, he goes, he was saying he was like, denial is like sleeping. You don't realize you're doing it when you're doing it. And I thought that was such a good line. That's exactly what denial is like, that you're just recognizing that there's weird stuff going on. Like, why is this person sporadically incoherent or stumbling? And why are there always so many beer cans around? Like, stuff where it's like, um, this is not complicated. <laughs> like, this is not confusing. But denial is a powerful thing. And if you're you know, for example, pregnant and about to have a child with someone, you're invested in not knowing what you know. And that's denial. And, and people manage to do it with all sorts of things, not just with um, substance abuse, obviously. People do it all the time, in, especially in families, I think, because you, get in, you, have, you have so much skin in the game. You're so invested in it working once you're in there that it's hard to be like, this is not my imagination. There's a problem that I can't fix. And that's what was valuable to me about Al-Anon. Even though there are things about Al-Anon that are very um, difficult to stomach as a, as a writer, as someone who cares a lot about words and gets real cranky about fake words like heteronormative, like in Al-Anon... What's the fake words they use? I'll tell, I'd be happy to tell you. They're like... Um, well, so for one thing, you don't say drinking. You say using. Oh, right, They'll be like, yeah. when she was using, and I'm like... You mean drinking? <laughs> Do you mean drinking? And so that's one. Another, this one drives me bonkers. Anybody in Al Anon or AA, any of the 12 step things, they don't say at a meeting, they say in the rooms. I just felt like my head was gonna blow off my body. <laughs> I've learned in the rooms, and it's like, what room? 
say at the meeting, we're here and we all know what a meeting is. Like, uh, so just dumb things like that would drive me crazy because I get hung up about language. But what was cool about it was that like part of relaxing with that and trying and just occasionally someone would, would say something like, the thing about denial is it's like sleeping, you don't know you're doing what you're doing. It is somebody would just say something that hit me so hard and that was so useful to me that I was temporarily disabled from being hypercritical and judgmental. <laughs> and since the whole message of the thing was surrender and that you can't control someone else, you can't control another person, it's just not gonna happen. I, fa I found that, I found going to those meetings extremely useful, extremely helpful. I got a lot out of it. I got a lot out yeah. of it, it meant a lot to me. They also teach you not to be, res that you're not responsible for another person. Were you able to let that all? No, I'm still working on it. It's, I think it's very hard. I think it's a very hard concept and I think it's a very tricky concept because we're all responsible for each other. And marriage and friendship and loving someone and committing to someone is saying, I will take some responsibility for you. So I found that concept much harder and much more confusing than you can't control another mm -hmm. person. Hmm. It's hard to draw the line between care and control when, when someone's destroying themselves, right? I mean, it's, where, where do you draw the line? You have a child also that's really responsible in your book, the yeah. girl Anna. The one child is responsible, the other one is just walking away, which is, I think, uh, both normal for people with addicted parents. Um, yeah, but she takes over all too, ma too much responsibility. Yeah, it's sad to see, right? When you read it, you think, poor girl. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite sad. Do you do you reckon that we will always be over responsible or over? Do you think you can ever find the for you, for example, find the perfect balance? Would you ever be able to do that, or is it always going to be over responsibility? And I don't know. I really, I really don't know. I really don't know. I, that's. I think that's a life's work, right? Is to no. figure out how 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 to take care of the people you love to the extent you can without imagining you have more power than you do, without assuming more power than you actually have. I think that's a life's, that's for me, part of a life's work is learning that. And I don't have that sorted, I don't have that figured out. No. Um, and I don't even neither have kids. Us, I Imagine think. if you had kids. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the hardest thing about parenthood, right? Is to what extent can you take responsibility for a human who's not you? Mm -hmm. The mother in uh, uh, Nina, your book, says to her daughter, people are not in the world to do what their father and mother have already done before. And then I was reading both your books and I know myself and I was thinking, well, that's exactly what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> I only, I, are, do you reckon we're, we're destined to somehow repeat uh, that you after hope all? You do some new stuff, right? Some, you hope you do some stuff better. I mean, a lot, you do the same and worse maybe even, but some stuff. Hopefully. I, like what? Um, like what? Uh, like communicating. I have a feeling that's something I, I, I learn better than my parents. Not because they, they were, I'm smarter than they are, because th th that's just something people learn these days, how to talk to each other. Uh, some, in therapeutic ways, some, maybe sometimes too therapeutic, but it's... It no, but you're right that the language and concepts of therapy right. have permeated yeah. the culture for, our, for people our age. That's and, exactly what I mean, and yeah. I think that's stupid sometimes, but it's also very useful. And, and the same thing you're, you're saying about El Anon, that would be useful, useful for everyone. To, it would be useful to be, for everyone. To be freed from the, from the, the, control, the, the controlling you and the, 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 that critic for a moment, right? That's, yeah. that's what you said it did, it, and I think everyone should go there. Well, the part of Al-Anon, I mean, the thing about it is, it's kind of the basis of every religion, right? Is right, to yeah. think, okay, I'm not the most powerful, I'm not in control, there's something more powerful than I am, and in various religions it's God, and in Al-Anon it's, they call it a higher power. And It's in, Christian, right? right? It's or any religion. Oh, Al-Anon, no. Yeah, no, it's not? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. No, uh -uh, there's no Jesus. 
Um, <laughs> there isn't. There's a God, though. There's a higher power, as mm. you define it. So, mm. for me, I thought about nature. Because truly, I mean, that's, I know it sounds like a little whole wheat bread, but truthfully, that's what I think is, is bigger. That's what was here before. That's what will be here after. That's why the last line of my book is about how the only person or entity who's free to do whatever she chooses, that's mother nature. It's not us. So that is to me a higher power. That's, that's, you know, that's what I learned from all this. So that, so all I'm saying is the idea of humility, the idea that you can't control other people, the idea that there's a power greater than yourself. All of that is just every religion that ever existed. So I think it's stuff that obviously as humans we need. Well, sure, and, then, but, and also in, in relation to our parents, again, also the idea that you can communicate to another person how you feel, that you can learn to do that, it's important, right? I, I think if my parents would have learned that earlier, they might have been a lot better off. That's just an example. Therapy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> let's, do, let's do it all. Um, why not? <laughs> um, I want to ask you two more questions before we go to the to the hall, and you can also ask some questions. Um, you wrote about the power of authorship, and how that also is something that a writer has maybe in their life. Can you tell me some more about that? I was I was saying in the book, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I forgot about that, and I like that part. I like that too. <laughs> it's I was just saying how if what you do all the time is organize narratives and decide, okay, would this work best here or here? Even as a nonfiction writer, right? Like everything I'm writing is to the best of my ability based on fact. And there's no, I don't have an imagination particularly. Um, the last event I was at, people, for some reason there was a lot of fiction writers and they all kept saying, why don't you write fiction? And I was like, you guys, I can't. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do it. I don't, I can't make anything up. It's just not my skill set. Anyway, point is that even as a nonfiction writer, you have a lot of power for crafting the narrative and deciding what things mean. And I think that that can have a tendency to perhaps make writers even more prone to the illusion of control hmm. than all of us are because you're used to having control over the narrative. And, you know, you can, you can, get in the habit of thinking everything's just a matter of rearranging the furniture until it looks just right. And it, and it took me a lot, of, a lot of loss to sort of admit that it wasn't up to me, that I wasn't going to get to choose the structure of my life. And in fact, my life looks, it's funny, both very different from the life I thought I had crafted in when I'm talking about this book, and also actually now that I think about it, exactly like what of course it looks like if you look at the choices I've made since I was a little kid. I see you nodding. No, I think it might be also a little bit the other way around. I mean, controlling people are prone to be writers. <laughs> That's... That's good. I hope there's a few people who are controlling and they're motivated by this. Um, yeah, my last question is, well, you, uh, you end also with a message of hope, that you manage to keep hope uh, even through everything. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Did it... Because when I lost all these things, I got to keep some things, right? So I lost my marriage, for example, which made me feel, I shouldn't say it made me feel. That's very un al -Anon. <laughs> It is. I felt like a failure at love. I felt like I am bad at love, which is the worst thing a person can be bad at. And I felt really awful about that. And I had to think about, okay, well, what do I have? I have friendships that have been around for 20 years, and that's a different kind of love, and that's something to be proud of and to treasure and to cling to. That's love, too. And I had to think about, okay, I've, you know, again, at the time, I felt like I have failed as a mother, as a wife and mother. So what did, what did I still have? Well, I was still a writer. So I had to cling to that and, and focus on this thing that couldn't be 
that couldn't, that was never going to get taken from me. Like, that's, I mean, maybe with a horrible head injury. But, like, bo basically, I had spent 20 years becoming a writer, and that wasn't going anywhere. So focusing on what I hadn't lost is what allowed me to have some hope and to kind of swim through. Thank you. I, I liked very much you said curiosity and hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. And curiosity is very, that's... Yes. You, you can imagine, right? That's such a life force. It's, it is such a life force. And that, I think, is the fun of, and I'm sure it's the fun of, of all sorts of writing and all sorts of creative endeavor. But to me, that's always been the defining pleasure of reporting, is, is curiosity, is the license to go into a situation or meet people and be like, I want to know this, I want to know this, I want to know this, and it's your job. And I, I think that's just such a pleasure. You think it can be taught, curiosity? Or you either have it or you don't? I'm sure it could be um, stimulated and fed. You know? Mm -hmm. I'm, sure, I'm sure there are things that could happen. It can grow. To, that would, would, yeah, I think you could probably do things to help that flourish in a person. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what else I think is about feminism, and I do feel comfortable talking about it, is the stuff that happens to half the human population around menstruation, menopause, infertility, birth, losing children, all that stuff that makes us human female animals that is not a big part of literature or film or art for a number of reasons. One, because it grosses people out, and two, because as feminists, we've been understandably very focused on saying, hey, up here, up here, not down here, up here. Focus on our brains so that you can take us seriously and think we're capable of running the company and the country. So we haven't been talking about our bodies in a long mm -hmm. time. But guess what? Those, those experiences are enormously influential in the lives of half the human population. So I feel really good about writing about one of those experiences and I feel really comfortable talking to other women about it. Mm -hmm.